Good day uh, to all of you, and thank you for joining us for the Global Center's briefing on emerging trends in terrorism and counterterrorism in advance of the 75th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, my name is Ilko Kessels. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Center on Cooperative Security, which is an independent, non-governmental organization that works to address the root causes of violent extremism. Uh, with me here today on your screen are my colleagues Tracy Derner, Director of Financial Integrity and Inclusion, and Melissa Leffes, Chief of Strategy of the Global Center. Today's briefing is intended to offer uh, our private sector partners insights into key issues expected to be addressed uh, at ANGA 2020, including emerging trends in terrorism and counterterrorism of relevance to international security, sustainable development, and the private sector. I would like to first start by thanking our colleagues at Baker McKenzie for their long-standing partnership with and support to the Global Center, and I'm grateful for their virtual co-hosting of today's event. It, this is the type of mutually beneficial collaboration that is very dear to us, ranging from organizational support to programmatic and practical partnerships. We're also very grateful to see so many of you joining us today, recognizing that some of you have long known our work, while for others, both the topic as well as our organization may be quite new. And during this one hour session, we hope to give you a tour of the many hot button issues that exist in our space and a sense of how these affect the daily lives and livelihoods of individuals around the world and may connect to your own work and corporate social responsibilities. Before providing introductory remarks, please allow me to review some housekeeping matters. Firstly, this session is being recorded. Uh, all participants have been muted and are in listen only mode. We will stop the recording before we begin the Q&A portion to allow everyone to ask frank questions. To ask a question, or if you need help, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will leave time at the end of the webinar to address questions, but we encourage you to send them throughout the presentation. And lastly, like most of you, we're all presenting from our homes. And while we've all attempted to create a studio-like atmosphere, including this background, please forgive the occasional dog bark or doorbell uh, that might occur. With that, I'm pleased to introduce the Global Center on Cooperative Security uh, and our work to all of you. The Global Center works to achieve lasting security by advancing inclusive, human rights-based policies, partnerships, and practices to address the root causes of violent extremism and terrorism. We focus on the root drivers of violent extremism by finding sustainable solutions through working with communities and local practitioners, national institutions, and international organizations like the United Nations, the African Union, the European Union, ASEAN, the World Bank, the Financial Action Task Force, and many, many others. In our work, we focus on four mutually reinforcing objectives. Firstly, we believe that resilient communities are best placed to tackle the underlying factors of violent extremism. That is why we partner with civil society organizations across the world to provide them with the knowledge, resources, and networks to address the drivers of terrorism. Secondly, we advance human rights and the rule of law to prevent and respond to violent extremism. Where criminal justice systems are weak or inaccessible, violent extremism can thrive. We have trained thousands of police officers, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and corrections officials to equip them with the knowledge and skills they need to handle terrorism cases in a manner consistent with human rights and the rule of law, for instance, in the Sahel and across South and Southeast Asia. Thirdly, we help governments, banks, and private sector institutions to combat illicit finance that support criminal and violent extremist organizations, often enabled by systemic corruption and perpetuate inequality. We've worked with over 200 institutions and businesses to build transparent, accountable, and inclusive financial systems in places like Ethiopia, Jordan, and Iraq. And fourth, we promote multilateral cooperation and rights-based standards in counterterrorism based on the belief that policies to address violent extremism are more effective when they are globally informed but locally grounded. We've advised over 150 governments and multilateral organizations in the design and implementation of these policies, ensuring that the experiences of civil society experts, local practitioners, and those directly affected by terrorism are carefully considered. We know that violent extremism fuels instability and thrives where institutions are not able to protect and serve the most vulnerable in society. This affects not only individual livelihoods and personal safety, but it actively undermines national and global security and business environments in our interconnected world. So since our establishment over 16 years ago, 
We've delivered hundreds of trainings, capacity development programs, and policy analysis in partnership with a broad range of actors, from United Nations bodies and experienced diplomats all the way to frontline counterterrorism practitioners, community-based organizations, and human rights defenders. In turn, we use the experience and insights gained in the delivery of these programs to shape policy at the national and multilateral levels. But what does it mean when we talk about terrorism and violent extremism? These are very highly contested terms, evidenced by the lack of an internationally agreed upon definition. Following 9-11, the terrorism threat to international peace and security primarily refer to the activities of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated networks. However, the threat landscape has since morphed and continues to be fluid, decentralized, opportunistic, and most present where governance is poor and the rule of law is weak. For instance, across the African continent, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, and Boko Haram affiliated groups number over 25 as they splinter, merge, and shift constantly. The fall of the physical caliphate in Syria and Iraq has seen ISIL fighters move to different locations around the world and left a tragic humanitarian crisis for local populations, internally displaced persons, and refugees alike. And thirdly, right-wing extremist terrorist attacks rose 320% over the past five years, and groups and ideologies are increasingly international in nature. In general, when we refer to terrorism, we refer to acts of violence committed on behalf of a group, a cause, or ideology to bring about political or social change, often provoking widespread fear, terror, and government retributions. The impact of terrorism is felt in many ways. In addition to the loss of human life, the Global Terrorism Index estimates that the global economic impact of terrorism is about 33 billion US dollars. That was the figure for 2018. Now it's important to note that this is a highly conservative estimate and does not include the cost of counterterrorism measures. As a comparison, the economic impact of violence in 2019 is estimated at 14.5 trillion in purchasing power parity which equals out to just under $2,000 per person is equivalent to 10.6% of the global GDP. Furthermore, the inherently political subjectivity of terms like terrorism and violent extremism have rendered the counterterrorism agenda ripe for abuses as anti-terror laws and policies are applied to silence political dissent, human rights defenders, and the press, and otherwise target particular groups perceived to pose a threat to governments. The global coronavirus pandemic has further accelerated this. Already marginalized parts of society are impacted most severely, and several governments have responded with a stretch of emergency measures, which the counterterrorism regime has already begun to normalize. In this climate, repressive national security-based responses to terrorism have further decreased the already limited space for civil society. Human security, justice, and social and economic development are intrinsically connected as emphasized in the Sustainable Development Goals, especially in Sustainable Development Goal 16, which aims to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. The United Nations General Assembly is a critical annual opportunity for public, private, and non-governmental sectors to come together and to discuss how these matters intersect, even when we're meeting virtually rather than in person. But unfortunately, as we've seen over the last years, both at discussions at the General Assembly uh, and at the domestic uh, level and regional level, the politics of terrorism and counterterrorism are anything but straightforward. And nowhere is it clearer than at the United Nations. At the international level, traditional alliances are becoming blurred. For instance, the United States is not always in lockstep with its traditional partners, its European allies, amongst others. One can, for instance, see this in the ongoing discussions uh, around Iran. The Security Council is also increasingly introducing far-reaching obligations, like the implementation of advanced passenger information and other types of travel data systems that raise a range of concerns, especially in less democratic countries or in cases where resources and available technologies are limited. At the national level, terrorism is often a transnational crime, but justice systems are confronted and confined uh, to national borders. Secondly, terrorist groups often exploit poorly or ungoverned territories or spaces, as we uh, see, for instance, in the Sahel, which has seen a dramatic decline in security in the last couple of years. And then importantly, 
counterterrorism measures themselves are often used to counter opposition, uh, to counter marginalized groups, uh, and target these individuals for purposes that are well beyond uh, the remits of the terrorism, counterterrorism mandates. And then finally, at the local level, all terrorism is local. Municipalities and local practitioners are an undervalued and under-resourced partner in these efforts, which is often uh, controlled and coordinated and implemented from the uh, national uh, level, from capital. And civil society groups are key in ensuring long-lasting solutions to terrorism. They need to be engaged and supported as full partners. Human security and community resilience are the principal aim. The Global Center works at all three of these levels. We invest in and partner with civil society groups. We build the capacity of government institutions and practitioners, and we shape policy at the international level. And in doing so, we hope that we can break the silos that exist between counterterrorism, peace and security, and development efforts. We hope that we can center a rights-based approach focused on justice and human security. We want to bring the pers perspectives of those most affected by terrorism and counterterrorism to the foreground. And lastly, we want to realize durable solutions to violent extremism by bringing in a broad range of governmental, civil society, and private sector actors in an inclusive and equal way. And to highlight this, and before turning to the briefings by my two colleagues, I would like to share a video that was developed as part of one of our programs during which we worked to build the capacity of youth-focused organizations in Kenya and Nigeria and support them in rolling out community initiatives. One morning, a, a, a woman came to my office and her son had been uh, recruited to violent extremism. And that morning, the son woke up in the morning and told the mother, I am going to Somalia. I am going to join the Al-Shabaab. And the woman came to me crying. And she asked, what can I do? I love my son, he's the only son. And he has boldly told me he's leaving. And so I had to think through and I, I decided to go and have a chat with the son. The, the, the experience and the skills that I've gained over time doing my work, I, I, I went and I invited him for a cup of coffee and we started to chat. And that he was supposed to travel that night to Somalia. But he said, yes, he will come. And so he came to my office. We just spent that the day with him. I bought them for lunch. So that day, that day he didn't travel again. <laughs> I did a program over almost a week to ask him if he could come and continue chatting. And I was able to show him how beautiful Kenya is. Talk to him about the future, he's, he had a young wife. Talk to him about his wife, positive things. And by the time I picked up in the morning, he was, he was a different man. So I delivered him to his mother, and his mother was just started screaming all over. He did, she didn't believe that this guy is, 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 is talking about religion, he's talking about government. He's talking about volunteering around, and he, for, he forgot the story of going back to Al Shabab. And that youth today is a, one of our champions. He's the one who actually runs our youth programs. And I, I mean, that really makes me feel that was something I made a huge contribution in that one person's life. Community based organizations are best to prevent and counter violent extremism because even after a project has ended, our lives within the community don't end. We know people. We know um, people who left to, 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 to go and join these violent extremist groups. Why do we, how do we know them? Because our neighbors, uh, neighbors to our neighbors, there are people we went to school with. But when it comes to violent extremism, the recruiters are in the community. The sympathizers are in the community. For us to to, to, to be real practitioners and to have those key results, you need very credible voices within uh, that community. Why? Look at the recruiters. Who are they? They're also people, credible voices. So you need somebody who is at par with them, somebody who can stand toe to toe, eye to eye with them, and uh, encounter all the narratives and the messages that they bring up. The Global Center has a unique way of working with partners and with organizations that they work with. They look at your work, they talk about your work with you. So I like that concept of collaboration where each person has a voice in the decision. Other people tell you what to do. The Global Center discuss with you what they think we should do as partners. As a local organization, we have a network of reach. 
the international organizations will have their own network of reach too. Maybe fundraising, networking, donor partnership, capacity building, they bring that to bear. So we are the eyes of the project on the ground and they become our eyes internationally in exposing what we do and getting people to understand that these are the kind of people that we're working with, these are the type of support and help that they need. These people are doing, you know that they are amazing. All they want is an opportunity. And I'm just hoping that we'll have other opportunities to help a lot more organizations in the future. Seeing communities, you know, moving from poverty to, to, to situations that they're able to feed their families, uh, seeing women and girls being able to raise their voices, uh, seeing communities engaging with government, and seeing government becoming more responsive uh, to community needs, that really makes me very happy and gives me the motivation to work even more. So these are just a few of our many partners, uh, Phyllis, Maggie, and others, with who we work tirelessly uh, um, and uh, implement these kinds of programs within their communities to address insecurity and violent extremism. This is the level where the real lasting change happens, but the connection between what happens in the communities and what is discussed at the national and international level, um, of course, has an impact. And that's what we'll be focusing uh, our discussions on today. My two colleagues um, will provide briefings that provide insights into some of these trends in terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, firstly, Tracy will start with discussing the impact of illicit financial flows, and then Melissa will look at human rights, criminal justice, and rule of law dynamics. Tracy, the floor is yours. Thank you, and greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Elko mentioned, we can recognize that terrorist attacks have an economic impact, both in the cost of recovery and in lost revenue for businesses and tourism sectors. But there are other important aspects to the economics of terrorism, including how illicit finance undermines economic development and in turn influences and sustains conflict. So when I talk about illicit financial flows, I'm referring to money that is illegally earned, transferred, or utilized across an international border. So examples would include the proceeds of organized crime, such as trafficking and smuggling, but also corruption, tax evasion, trade manipulation, as well as terrorism financing. Illicit financial flows can have a big impact on economic stability of a country, including by draining foreign exchange reserves, affecting asset prices, lowering tax receipts, and reducing government revenue. As you can see here on the chart, according to estimates from the Global Financial Integrity, 141 of the world's developing economies lost a total of $6.6 .6 trillion due to illicit financial flows between 2003 and 2013. That's more than twice their GDP growth in that time period. And these numbers are rising. In 2014 alone, illicit financial flows topped $1.1 trillion representing more than those countries took in via foreign direct investment and official development assistance combined. So to be blunt, we have an ineffective system that's spinning its wheels. All of the revenue being earned or received is being lost due to a lack of transparency and accountability in the financial system. And the responsibility for that lies on all sides. While the money is being lost from developing economies, more than half of it ends up in developed ones. The need to combat illicit finance is underscored in the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically under SDG 16, focused on peaceful and inclusive societies. SDG 16 sets a target goal of significantly reducing illicit financial and arms flows, strengthening the recovery and return of stolen assets, and combating all forms of organized crime. The inclusion of illicit finance as an SDG target recognizes that in order for development to be sustainable, Countries need resources to launch infrastructure projects, pursue economic expansion, and meaningfully advance poverty alleviation and health measures. They simply cannot do that if they're losing more money via illicit financial outflows than they are generating or receiving. But addressing illicit financial flows is positioned under a goal related to peaceful and inclusive societies for an important reason. Illicit finance is the lifeblood that enables and perpetuates systems of inequality, corruption, and injustice. These are the factors that drive and fuel violent extremist recruitment. 
most of the fastest growing economies in the world are among those that are losing substantive resources to illicit financial outflows, meaning that the rising tide of economic growth is only raising a few boats. And too often, those are the boats of the criminal and the corrupt. This fractures state society relationships and exacerbates feelings of marginalization, disenfranchisement, and relative deprivation, creating fertile ground for violent extremist recruitment. Let me give you an example of one way in which these pieces fit together. In doing so, I'll draw on the Global Center's experiences advancing transparency and accountability in government and partnering with local actors on the front lines of combating violent extremism in their communities. So we know that poverty alone is not a causal factor in radicalization to violent extremism, but a lack of socioeconomic mobility can be. More than half of the recruits to Boko Haram in Nigeria and Al-Shabaab in Somalia reported that frustration over their economic situation was a factor in their decision to join the terrorist group, with employment cited as the most frequently important need at the time of joining. More than 80% of these recruits also believed that government only looks after the interests of a few. Like much of the African continent, Nigeria and Somalia are experiencing a significant youth bulge. The average age in both countries is just 18, compared to 38 in the US and 40 in the UK. For some countries on the African continent, nearly 80% of the total population is younger than 25. For any country, it would be difficult to harness the economic potential of such youth bulges and to avoid crippling levels of unemployment and underemployment. There have been significant investments in education and vocational training programs in Africa, but in order for those to be successful, there must be similar growth in job markets who must be able to keep pace and absorb a rapidly expanding and more highly educated workforce. I've heard many stories from our partners on the ground describing these situations where an entire village comes together to support and invest in a promising student's education. These students go and graduate from university and go to the capital cities in search of jobs that just don't exist, not unless you come from a privileged segment of society. They talk of their experiences showing up for a job interview and finding lines of more than 100 pre-qualified candidates waiting outside. So what happens to these individuals? They're separated from their families and their support structures, they're unable to attain the cultural markers of adulthood like marriage and land ownership. And they're often left feeling as though their government is not going to work for people like them. Some have told me that they felt that they failed not just themselves, but they're an entire village who was counting on them to succeed. It's this profile that can be preyed on by violent extremist groups who offer promises of community, of purpose, and of, in short, being able to offer an alternative and a sense of retribution. And those alternatives are increasingly taking different and creative forms as violent extremist groups adapt. For example, we've seen Boko Haram capitalize on the lack of employment opportunities to offer entrepreneurship loans to youth to start local businesses, which in turn, the terrorist group then co-ops for resources, logistics, or to conceal its illicit finance. Now, these are complex issues and radicalization to violent extremism is a highly individualized process that cannot and should not be generalized. But what we do know is that terrorism has the space to thrive in contexts where inequality, corruption, and injustice pervade. By combating illicit finance, we help address the enabling environment for terrorism, while also plugging the hole through which our development and tried finance is leaking, increasing the impact and sustainability of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for uh, those, those insights. I'm going to use my sort of chair's privilege to ask you one question before we turn to, uh, to Melissa. Um, we know that efforts to combat illicit and terrorist finance have had significant ne negative consequences as well, as much uh, as they uh, may be uh, necessary. Can you describe the evolution of these efforts and how they are affecting the private sector, civil society organizations, humanitarian aid workers alike? Sure. So as terrorist organizations become increasingly decentralized and the cost of an attack declines due to the use of simple things like knives and cars, it's really complicated our efforts to combat terrorism financing. Rather than disrupting the business model of a large scale organization, we're instead looking to identify isolated transactions or identify financial relationships. Doing so is virtually impossible without the context provided by a criminal or intelligence investigation. Many terrorism financing transactions appear, or in some cases are, legal, 
meaning they can't be detected unless we know who or what we're looking for. But there remains a justifiable emphasis on preventing and intercepting terrorism financing. And financial institutions are being asked to shoulder the burden of this work, including by increasing their transaction monitoring, gathering additional information, and increasingly taking on more and more compliance obligations. This is incredibly expensive. It's estimated that US financial service firms spend about $25 billion a year to meet their illicit financial obligations. This represents a miscalibration between policy and practice that's having three significant consequences. The first is that it's contributing to an increasingly risk averse scenario for financial institutions. Banks are now declining to open or retain accounts for clients that, where they believe the risk is higher than the reward. This is a practice that's become known as de-risking and affects correspondent banks and nonprofit organizations, especially those in conflict zones. The second consequence is that measures to counter illicit finance are being abused by states to create arduous and complicated administrative barriers for nonprofit organizations to operate. Most often, these are directly intended to constrict civic space or used to target political dissidents and human rights activists. The third consequence is that absent a definition of terrorism from the United Nations, states have established overly expansive ones or apply the terrorist label in politically expedient ways. For humanitarian actors, the issue of who's considered a terrorist and by whom becomes especially tricky in light of bans on providing material support to terrorism. Aid organizations are increasingly operating in complex situations where armed conflict, terrorism, and humanitarian crises overlap. It's important to ensure that aid is not misappropriated by terrorist actors, but it can be difficult to discern civilians from terrorism supporters. In the absence of such certainty, terrorism financing legislation essentially criminalizes the provision of humanitarian services, jeopardizing fundamental humanitarian principles of neutrality and impartiality and having a chilling effect on humanitarian operations. The overextension of efforts to combat illicit finance can be counterproductive. Constricting civil space, which serves as an outlet and an avenue of recourse for those experienced socioeconomic economic, and political grievances. And instances of de-risking can force finance into less regulated channels, limiting our visibility into and therefore our ability to combat illicit financial flows. So the trick here is balance and finding a proportionate and risk-based approach that is grounded in human rights and good governance, but also meaningfully advances transparency and accountability for all actors. Thank you, Tracy. Um, for those, those insights, uh, I again want to encourage before we're moving to, to Melissa, if this presentation uh, raised any questions or any comments, uh, please raise those in uh, the Q&A um, section, which you'll find at the bottom uh, of your screen. And, and we'll hope to be able to address uh, some of those questions uh, that will come in during this, um, the presentation, but also many of the questions that we received um, as part of the registration form from a, a range of participants. Uh, turning now to Melissa Leffes, uh, Global Center's Chief of Strategy, uh, to focus particularly on the human rights, criminal justice, uh, and rule of law elements. Thank you, Elko, and good day to everyone joining us for this briefing. I will be building on Tracy's presentation while honing in a little bit more specifically on the UN's role in terrorism, counterterrorism, and specific trends that we will be tracking for this year's 75th session of the UN General Assembly. The UN is but one of a panoply of multilateral entities engaging on matters relating to counterterrorism. In our assessment, um, the UN disting distinguishes itself from the rest through its four principal roles as a norm setter, a convener, a technical assistance provider, and a global monitor. How the UN system leverages these comparative advantages or not forms the basis of its relevance today. As a norm setter, the United Nations and its member states have adopted and developed an ever growing number of resolutions, tools, and documents to counter terrorism and its financing. As was previously noted, there is no internationally agreed upon definition of terrorism. In its absence, 19 international legal instruments conventions and protocols define various terrorism acts, such as acts of terrorism committed aboard aircrafts or related to nuclear terrorism. 
More recently, the Security Council has focused much attention on topics most relevant to the crisis in Syria and Iraq, including approaches on how to manage detained third country nationals. As a convener, the blue banner still holds considerable pull, able to bring a wide range of governmental and non-governmental entities to the table. For example, biennially, member states come together to review the UN's 2006 Global Counterterrorism Strategy. This process brings together the 193 member states in a multi-month process of assessing the UN and member states' performance against the strategy and setting priorities for the coming two years. The June 2020 review of the strategy was postponed to 2021, when the UN and its cohort of diplomats hope to resume work more regularly. As a technical assistance provider, the United Nations can support the proliferation of its norms and implementation of its strategy through legal assistance, institutional capacity development, and practitioner training by a veritable alphabet soup of UN entities, which, inc which now includes the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism, a newly established entity in 2018, along with a dedicated Undersecretary General on Counterterrorism. Together, 43 entities endeavor to coordinate their efforts through the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact. To give you a sense of scale, in 2019, the Global Compact members had about 522 million budgeted for counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism efforts. And finally, as a global monitor, various UN entities monitor and analyze national and global trends in terrorism, counterterrorism, and preventing violent extremism. This includes, among others, the country assessments and trends reports developed by the Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate and the reports of the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team on ISIL, Al Qaeda, and the Taliban. To demonstrate the interplay of, between the comparative advantages, please allow me to introduce one of the Global Center's partnerships with the United Nations. From 20, 2009 to 2019, the Security Council's Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, referred to as CTED, and the Global Center ran a program which aimed to improve due process, human rights, and the rule of law in the handling of terrorism cases across South Asia. Working with over 100 experienced judges in several national judicial training academies, and with the generous support of our partners at Baker and McKenzie and Salesforce, the Global Center and CTED prepared a toolkit for judges and training academies in the region for the handling of terrorism cases in compliance with human rights and the rule of law. The convening power of the UN brought together practitioners from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India to discuss important matters of international cooperation in an apolitical forum. The toolkit was subsequently launched in the UN's New York headquarters during an open briefing by Supreme Court justices from across South Asia, as well as Justice Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. The UN's comparative advantages have, however, been challenged um, by leadership in a changing world one in which hard-won normative gains are confronted with the stark realities of dire socioeconomic inequalities, growing nationalism and authoritarianism, and a shrinking space for human rights and humanitarian action. As a rallying cry, the 75th session of the UN, which officially began yesterday, is organized under the banner of the future we want, the UN we need, reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. Typically, UNGA would be a critical, critical time to move agendas forward. The New, York, New York's Turtle Bay would be a buzz with private bilateral meetings interspersing high level events on a range of topics. What is typically a busy moment for diplomacy will be quite different this year, more low key, perhaps more introspective. However, the productivity of member states during this time should not be underestimated particularly in an environment where it is not about measuring the gains made in the promotion and protection of human rights, but rather about the standards that can be preserved. As a result of these dynamics, we will be tracking two important trends this, during this UN General Assembly. The first is the UN's response to shrinking civic space, and the second is how the UN will 
promote and res the respect of due process and human rights standards. A vibrant and active civil society plays a critical role in empowering communities, enhancing resilience, supporting accountability and transparency, advancing the rule of law, and achieving the purposes and principles set out in the UN Charter. However, the proliferation of counterterrorism and PVE measures preventing violent extremism has in many cases securitized the roles of civil society and been directly correlated to shrinking civic space as Tracy previously mentioned. Provisions restricting the freedom of expression and opinion, association, assembly, and religion, as well as administrative measures have also been invoked to target civil society activities. The operational space for civil society is further being constrained by onerous restrictions at the local, national, and international levels imposed as part of the countering terrorism financing regulations and sanctions regimes. Although some improvements have been made to the UN's ability to support member states in their implementation of the global counterterrorism strategy, abuses continue to arise from the application of broadly defined terrorism laws. Violations in the space include warrantless surveillance, prolonged arbitrary detentions, torture, and ill treatment, the use of extrajudicial or arbitrary executions, and other abuses that may themselves amount to crimes against humanity. Without adequate safeguards and normative leadership, the UN system's counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism policy, coordination, technical assistance, and advocacy risks causing more harm than good. The UN, however, is comprised of its member states, and so the international body is showing signs of mirroring global decline in human rights and civil liberties. Freedom House reported that in 2019, um, that 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. The gap between setbacks and gains widened compared to 2018 as individuals in 64 countries experienced deterioration in their political rights and civil liberties with those in just 37 experiencing improvements. Norm setting continues to play an important role in UN counterterrorism work principally clarifying safeguards and providing guidance to member states. Words must be followed by action, and concerns have been voiced about the absence of clear UN leadership on counterterrorism abuses. This slippage is happening in a variety of ways, and I wanted to share three specific examples to illustrate the point. The first relates to an official's travel priorities. In 2019, the Under Secretary General came under fire for a visit to the Xinguan, Xinjiang region of, in China, where the mass detention of Uyghur and other Muslim communities for alleged counterterrorism purposes went unmentioned during a briefing on the implementation of the global counterterrorism strategy. At the time, the Under Secretary General was the highest ranking official to visit this Chinese region. The principles enshrined in the UN Charter require of UN officials clear affirmations and policy leadership to address violations and human right, of human rights eroded in the name of counterterrorism. The second example relates to the funding structure of the UN's counterterrorism efforts. Many experts and diplomats have criticized the pay to play nature wherein select donors can influence policy priorities and practices. Since it's the establishment of the UN Counterterrorism Trust Fund in 2009, Saudi Arabia and Qatar represent 74% of all cash pledges. Member states may, fund, may also fund activities in partnership with the UN Office of um, Counterterrorism, as was the case with regional high-level conferences hosted by Belarus and Budapest. The third example points to the slow and meticulous method of eroding due process protections from UN resolutions, as has been the widely cited efforts employed by Egypt, who are shifting the focus from the human rights obligations of governments to uh, the socio and economic impacts of terrorism on, uh, on communities. Further analysis will be released in our forthcoming publication, an independent uh, um, analysis of the UN undertaken by the Global Center biannually. 
I thank you for your attention. Melissa, thank you so much for, for sharing those insights uh, in terms of how the international community in general, but the UN in particular, uh, is operating in this space. Uh, one quick question for you, and then we're going to move uh, with about 15 minutes left to the Q&A part uh, of uh, this uh, session. Um, Melissa, you already referred to one of the issues that has really gripped the world, which are the abhorrent conditions of individuals, including families and young children, that are um, in refugee camps, such as Al Hal in, in Syria, uh, partly due to the very low numbers of individuals that are being repatriated uh, to their countries of origin. Could you share a little bit how the UN and member states have positioned themselves on this topic and, and what future there is uh, for these individuals? Absolutely. Uh, the manner in which the UN was, is responding to the issues of repatriation can in many ways be um, brought back to how the sit of the departures of individuals who left for Syria and Iraq were handled. In 2016, the discourse on rights compliant administrative measures, such as the stripping of individuals, stripping individuals of their nationality, was a central point of debate, and it continues to be. That same issue arises now where third country nationals, many of whom are being held in detention, are not proactively being repatriated. Across Europe, for instance, the standards for repatriation are extremely low, often limited to orphan children. At the UN, the Security Council has yet to address the issue of repatriations. In fact, just last month, Indonesia tabled the resolution pertaining to uh, related issues, but shirked the discussion on repatriation. As a result, the US vetoed the resolution on the grounds that it did not adequately reflect the responsibilities of member states. The issue will certainly remain divisive and one to follow. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate those insights and particularly recalling the very uh, tense debate uh, on that uh, particular uh, resolution. Uh, we're now going to uh, shift to the uh, Q&A session. Thank you for so many of you um, that have submitted questions both in the Q&A itself but also uh, prior uh, to uh, this uh, uh, meeting. Um, but before we do that, I also just want to indicate that uh, this is but one uh, event in a series of events that we're undertaking. And uh, in a couple of weeks' time, just after the completion uh, of ANGA, um, we, uh, on the uh, 6th of October um, 2020 from 10 to 11.30, we'll be hearing from private sector and philanthropic leaders about the impacts and implications of violent extremism on corporate responsibility, accountability, uh, and risk. And so we hope that uh, all of you and many more can join that session uh, for a continuation of, of that discussion. Uh, having said that, we're now going to uh, stop the recording and we're going to go into uh, the Q&A uh, session of this uh, meeting. Um, and many questions have come in uh, 